So today we're going to be talking about methamphetamine, heroin, and diverted pharmaceuticals. Now, uh, it's not so much just to learn about these different chemicals, but also to be thinking about this part of the course. Where are we? Where are we in the course? We're in the chemical evidence part of the course. So, of course, when we seize a drug or whatever, we've got the active ingredient, and we can we can analyze that. But be thinking about all of the other kinds of chemical evidence we would find in a clandestine lab or whatever. So that's the that's sort of the lens that I want you to focus on, uh, look through as a scientist to say what other kinds of indicators of criminal activity might there be. Okay, so let's jump into that. <clears throat> okay. That light is bright. So one of the things that we can do with chemical activity, uh, chemical evidence, is to, to focus in on the different isomers that you have, because these may be different in different formulations, okay? And this even takes into account uh, optical isomers and antimers, you know, things that have chiral centers. And so if you could get down into a, a chiral selective detection, which would be a little bit more advanced than just, say, definitely more advanced than a spot test. Uh, or maybe even a mass spec. A mass spec is going to see how the molecule fragments. I don't know that there's going to be um, chiral differences in how a molecule fragments. Maybe there are. But but if you could determine the differences in the chiral centers uh, and which forms the molecules in, then you might be able to track the source of that kind of substance. So let's just review again. Remember the chirality review and the, the convention of priority? And you can look to see if it's a a, a right rotation or a left rotation, like in this case, we put the lowest priority in the back, the little hydrogen in the back, and and the priority numbers are going like this, and 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 so you've got a right rotation or a left rotation. Uh, that's where the the um, the R and and L or R and S come from. R rectus, Latin for right, and S for sinister, Latin for left. I always thought that was funny, <laughs> but anyway, R and S, Latin for right and left. You also have the optical uh, rotation of plane polarized light, which is determined as L and D. So this is an unambiguous structural rule, meaning it's based on the molecule. The L and D. Uh, rotation, optical activity, is based on how it rotates the plane polarization of light. And it's not always easy to tie the, the, the L and the D to the, the chiral centers and predict which way is it going to rotate light. Okay, so rotating light is a, is a function of the material dissolved in the solution. And it is, it is a function of chiral molecules, but in terms of determining structurally why this particular chiral molecule rotates light to the right or to the left is, is not, uh, not easy to determine. But anyway, you can separate them uh, uh, into two different categories. And then if they have multiple chiral centers, then you have multiple combinations. So this is just ephedrine molecule. It has an OH on it. And it's got two chiral centers. And so you have four possibilities. You have the RS, SS, RR, and SR. So you have, again, different ways to um, analyze this molecule. You could maybe see trends and where it was made, um, and so on. Now let's get into how we turn in this ephedrine into methamphetamine. If we could remove this OH group here, okay, then we end up with methamphetamine. And so this is a, a, a sketch of the, of the synthesis, the Birch synthesis. There's several synthesis paths for methamphetamine. Uh, there's a few steps missing for public safety. Okay, just a little <laughs> disclaimer. But essentially, you grind up the methanol, dissolve it in, uh, or extract it, dissolve it in a in some sort of organic uh, organics solvent. A lot of times they use ether, but you can use eth methanol. Um, redissolve it in water and add dry lithium, or add small amounts of of water and and add lithium from batteries. So if you see a bunch of cut up batteries with a lot of Sudafed, that's suspicious, okay? Um, anhydrous ammonia, well, okay, that's tricky to find. You might get it from agriculture, stealing it from a, a farming outfit where they, they put ammonia in the soil. It's, it's kind of an interesting thing. They put ammonia in the soil and then the bacteria turn it into ammonium. They turn it into to, to, uh, inorganic nitrogen that the plants can use. But they're, they're, they're helping the bacteria, and the bacteria are helping the plants. So that's why the farmers will have these tanks of anhydrous ammonia. So when, uh, 
a meth lab person steals one of those tanks, they need a tank to put it in. And so that's where we get that blue valve on the propane tanks. And so they'll take a propane tank, they'll have the hosing, they'll hook it up to this large tank, and they'll, you know, open both valves, and then the ammonia flows into their propane tank, they close them both, and then go and use the anhydrous ammonia. Another way to produce it is to take ammonia, <clears throat> ammonium nitrate and then make it basic. And so when you make it basic, you're going to deprotonate that ammonium and make ammonia. So that's another form of getting ammonium. But if you're buying large amounts of ammonium nitrate, that's also used in ammonium nitrate fuel oil. So you're going to probably tickle the web a little bit if you're buying large amounts of ammonium nitrate. Uh, adding or organic ex, uh, solvent, liquid-liquid extraction. Again, you're going to play with that solubility of that molecule, whether it's in the aqueous phase or in the in the organic phase. If you get it into the organic solvent, then you can salt it out with an HCl generator. And we'll see these, and we'll if you see those in a lab, uh, we'll see several examples of what they look like today. <clears throat> and then you filter the methamphetamine salt. <clears throat> So here's, <clears throat> here's a one-pot synthesis, and I want to show this video um, just so that you uh, see pretty much how easy it is, but also how extremely dangerous it is. So let's look at that. Adjust my windows. Let's move this over. And it's going to be... So there's no audio on this video, so I'll do a voiceover. <laughs> okay, so, so this is what they call the one-pot method. So they've taken the ephedrine tablets and they grind them up with a coffee grinder. Okay, so you got a coffee grinder full of white or red powder. That's not coffee, <laughs> right? So that's suspicious. <clears throat> ammonium nitrate, so that's going to be their source of ammonia. They're using a lot, obviously. So this is the Washington State Police that are doing this and filming this video, and they were showing their officers like all the different things that are going to be in a clandestine lab and just to instruct people on how how easy it is to make and why it's so prevalent and you can see it all over the all over the country okay no danger so far it's just a couple of white powders mixed together okay ether this is a little bit dangerous very flammable okay ether is famous for flashing back so it's heavier than air so it'll travel along the ground and it'll hit a flame source somewhere else, like the pilot light on a gas-powered uh, hot water heater, and flash back and then catch fire. So it'll run across the ground and then up to, like if you're working at a bench. So there's lots of um, danger in organic lab when you're dealing with ether extraction. You don't necessarily smell it. I mean, you smell it, but you're, there's a lot thicker vapor layer that's flowing down off the bench and across the floor. So. While they're holding it upside down is there's a tube, if that, if that, I can't draw it because I'm watching the video, but here's the can, there's a tube that goes to the bottom and there's pressure at the top. And so it pushes the liquid through the tube and out the, out the spray spots. We flip it over, now the tube is sticking up into the pressurized zone. And so you're just relieving the pressure in the can. And then they pop holes at it, pour it in. Uh, you saw how they opened the battery, they had a pipe cutter, they opened the battery, pulled out the lithium. Uh, lithium is a very soft metal. You can tear it with your hands, well, kind of like tinfoil. And they're dropping little pieces in there. This is when it's getting dangerous because now you have lithium. Lithium reacts with water and will spark. And so if there's moisture in this uh, solution, you could get a spark <coughs> and you could catch the ether on fire. Okay. Then sodium hydroxide changes the... Um, the pH of the aqueous layer. There's no aqueous layer yet. They're going to add a couple of capfuls of water. And so this is a pretty dangerous mix. Yeah, yeah, that's right. All this stuff that you could have around the house. Yeah, I know. Yeah, they do have a fume hood, but you can make a fume hood. Just 
we made one in college. I'll tell you about that someday. <laughs> so. <laughs> so it puts a couple of uh, capfuls of sodium hydroxide, I mean, uh, water in there, starts to shake it well. Notice he's, he's constantly relieving the pressure because as that sodium hydroxide deprotonates that ammonium, then it generates ammonia gas. Okay. This, this is the part that makes me nervous, like just watching it. I've seen this video a bunch of times and just to see the sparks in the bottom just makes me cringe. Okay. So now watch, he's going to add something new here to his safety equipment. Oh, did you see the bottle swell? You can watch it again. You see the bottle swell. See? Little, little blast shield. <laughs> and I bet he's left-handed. <laughs> you always use your non-dominant hand, right? You, so finally he took the cap off. And he's getting more sodium hydroxide. They made a mistake. They saw his face on that. Look at that reaction. So the lithium is a reducing agent. So that's what's going on. This is electrochemistry going on there and there. So that it's reducing the molecule, putting a hydrogen on in the place of that hydroxide. And now it's making methamphetamine. Uh, it's, it's an organic. I mean, most of that solution and there's the ether. So they got two cans of ether in there. So the, the deprotonated methamphetamine is in the organic layer. So all of that other stuff is just junk left over from the tablets, the cold tablets, um, byproducts of the reaction. So the methamphetamine is in the, in the solution. Okay. He's got secondary containment in case it busts. Did you notice that? Yeah, so they didn't want to send a bunch of uh, methamphetamine-laden ether down the drain in the hood. <laughs> it's like, rats, now what? <laughs> Okay, then they get to a spot test. Come on, let's go. We got got an exam to study for. <laughs> yeah, so here they take a little bit out. We'll cut to the chase. All right. So he pulls a little bit out with a pipette of the ether solution. Now this is the cool thing. Okay, this is uh, um, he's got a little bit of HCl, caps it off, and the vapor pressure of HCl is such that it'll blow out that tube. And so this is an organic solution with an with a deprotonated base. You bubble HCl in there, it protonates the molecule, and you have a crystal. And it just drops out of the organic solution. Easy peasy. The separation is super easy when you have an organic solution with an organic base. If you put HCl gas in there, it'll start dropping out. They call it salting out. So then he puts it in a couple of little witness uh plates here and then you add some of the coloring agent you got the marquee test and the ducano levine test and you get the different color changes then uh they also show a chromatogram and this one he did a pretty good job look the pseudoephedrine is almost all gone so anyway he could have his own tv show yes <laughs> so you wouldn't be able to tell based on purity how this is like if you had like an entire I don't think no I don't think so I mean you're not from that chromatogram right uh, you might be able to get in there and uh, with like I said I don't know uh, much about enantiometric specific uh, detection right they might make chiral columns and liquid chromatography I think I've heard of that yeah, where they might be able to separate things based on their chirality. Uh, but uh, but this one, um, it was pretty pure, and you might be able to look for residual solvent and know that it used ether, not methanol, or something like that. And so if you can get the powder and you can do that desorption, that uh, warm it up so it desorbs the solvent from the powder, and then collect that on an adsorbent tube and then put it in a desorbing GC inlet, then you might be able to see a residual solvent. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of complication to this synthesis. You might be able to see, maybe you could see some impurities from the original tablets, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So let's go. Let's see if this, let's get that one. And I'm gonna break my neck. Oh, there you go, turn around here. All right, so let's go back.
And so we saw uh, in there, they used an HCL generator in the lab. Now they just had a bottle of uh, aqueous hydrochloric acid and they just put a, I, I saw it in sort of the base of it in the, in the back of the video. Uh, but this is, these are what these things are called, HCL generators, okay? And then for salting bases out from organic solvents, not just for meth lab, but also if you're gonna try to recrystallize um, plant extract like uh, cocaine or something, you recrystallize it, you pull it into the organic phase, you throw away all the stuff that doesn't or dissolve in the organic phase, and then you bubble HCL into that organic phase and you salt out the, the, the organic base. And that all we're doing is we're flooding the system with chloride ions, like, like sodium chloride, right? You could do that too. Um, and Le Chatelier's principle is going to produce HCl gas. And it's going to be, at, it's not going to be a huge pressure, but it's enough to, to push, push itself out of the headspace. You put a tube on that and it'll bubble. And you just have a gentle bubbling hydrochloric acid. Okay. This one's kind of, kind of uh, advanced. It's got a valve. It's got a little pressure gauge and everything. But this is the this is like a mustard container from the dollar store, you know, and some some Tigon tubing. Um, this is a propane tank. Here's a fire extinguisher. So yeah, this is evidence of clandestine activity. Uh, here's the number of meth lab incidents from 2000 to 2019. I looked this morning to see if this chart had been updated. It hasn't been updated. A lot of the data collection kind of disappeared during COVID, and so we're starting to see some of it come back, but. Uh, it looks like a good thing, right? We've dropped down in the in the U.S. to only 890 labs in 2019. So this seems like a positive trend. But what's really the trend is that we're seeing uh, it coming across the border. So it's not that meth use has dropped. Uh, it's that we're just not synthesizing it here and we're bringing it across the border. Okay. Uh, the newest and most serious threat is fentanyl. You've heard of that, I'm sure. Um, we can look here at the number of deaths from drug poisoning involving cocaine in the United States in the District of Columbia from 2010 to 2018, up to 15,000, okay, in 2018. That's an enormous number of people, if you think about it. And then here, heroin doses, overdoses. So heroin by itself is the green line. And notice it peaked 2015 and has come down to about 6,000 in 2018. And then heroin overdoses with fentanyl have started to grow. And so they're mixing fentanyl in and now it's surpassed the regular heroin. So we're up to 15,000 overdose deaths from, from heroin and heroin with fentanyl. So there's 30,000 people right there. Uh, synthetic opioids uh, other than methadone. So these would be also diverted pharmaceuticals where people take too much of the pharmaceuticals, and if they have fentanyl laced in them, then this is now 31,000. It's just it's really, really devastating. This is uh, how they will hide uh, these different tablets and so on. These are, these are bags of pills. They've got uh, heroin concealed in a vehicle bumper. Here's heroin concealed inside a fire extinguisher. Uh, they're pretty clever people. Um, I have a friend of the family. He was a state trooper and he he just got lucky a lot of times in finding drugs when he, he and he said a lot of times the people are so uh confident on a traffic stop you ask if you can search the vehicle and they're like yeah thinking they'll never find it right and one of the ones was he went around he opened and closed all the doors looked in the seats lifted up the seats and all of that stuff and then when he closed one of the doors it had a different weight to it than the other doors it's a small like a nissan car so it had pretty lightweight doors and he said but this door he was moving this door and he moved that door he's like yeah this one has a lot more weight so he starts popping the panels off the door and it was all stuff drugs were all stuffed in the panels of the door there was another one he, he knew this this uh driver was he was suspicious for whatever reason and uh, he asked if he could search the truck it was a flatbed truck with the wood wood deck and so he looks all over and he couldn't find anything and so he, he's about to let him go, and he's got his hand on the side of the, the flatbed part, and he looks down, and it's an old wood deck, but it's got brand new bolts. <laughs> and so he's like, he went just a minute, <laughs> got his right socket set, and undid some of those bolts, and underneath all of those pieces of wood was a bunch of drugs in the, the bed of the truck. So it was pretty interesting. And then here's a counterfeit oxycodone tablet containing fentanyl. 
I mean, they have the, the exact imprints and everything that you would expect in a commercial tablet. Yeah. Oh, really? Like, yeah, like over the counter Narcan. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, I've never seen like commercial. Yeah. yeah. What's the What's the stuff they spray in your nose? Is that? Yeah. 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 So I mean, they're they're actually promoting that so that you could have it in your backpack. Like if you're walking down the street and somebody is taking what they thought was an oxycodone and it was fentanyl, um, and their their lungs essentially have seized up. They're not breathing. You can spray that in their nose, and so that's what uh, that's what you know. Police are now are having having incidents. Here's a here's a video that shows uh, a sheriff. He he got he got some on him, and he said, "I realized I had gotten some on me, and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe." So he passed out and it started turning blue, and they got the Narcan up his nose. He oh he's he's inspecting a Jeep, yeah yeah a red Jeep. And it's pretty tragic. They had to give him three doses. So by the time he got to the emergency room, he would seize up again and they would give him some more. He survived. But the scary part was hearing his story afterwards because he said, I, I knew I had been exposed to drugs and he was fully aware consciously, but his lungs, his lungs just weren't like his diaphragm was paralyzed. So he wasn't able to breathe. So that's just terrifying if you think about it. I mean, it's not like you went to sleep and died. Uh, his lungs quit and he was aware he couldn't breathe and he wanted to breathe, but it just wouldn't work. So this, that's fentanyl is just not good. Not good. Here's uh, where all the opiates come from. <clears throat> so this is a poppy seed pod. So I love poppies. They're beautiful red flowers. It's unfortunate that they're <laughs> it's so, um, you know, valuable for the, for the drugs that are in this milky latex. So this, this is the latex coming out of that plant. And latex rubber and latex uh, paints have that name latex. And it's so any of the any of this milky substance that comes out of a plant is latex. It's not just the poppy seed latex. But the latex in the poppy seed pod is up to 10% morphine. That's pretty, pretty potent. And it has 1.5% codeine and some other smaller. Uh, components. This is a great video. If you if you pull up the PDF and you can watch it on your own time, it talks about the the. Um, I mean, this is a pharmaceutical substance, and there are farms that grow it. And uh, the video there is from a farm in India where they have people go out and they they score the little seed pod, and the latex comes out, and so they go down a row and they score all of them so that it all leaks, and then they come back the next day or later that afternoon after it's kind of dried and made itself more concentrated. And then they, they collect the concentrated dried latex off the poppy seed pods. And then they go and purify it. Okay, so, so you can watch that video on your own. So here's what comes out of the plant, morphine, codeine, and thebane. And here's where we get into the chemistry. Again, I'm not gonna have you necessarily draw all of these substances or come up with an IUPAC name for this thing. We're just gonna call this morphine. Okay, and look at codeine. This is a methoxy group. Okay, and I want you to be able to recognize the difference between a methoxy. Oops, I can't spell it. And an acetyl group. Okay, so right here, this is acetomorphine. comes from acetic acid, right? CH3COOH is acetic acid. So that's where acetylation comes from. We take acetic acid and react it with the hydroxyl group. If it's a condensation reaction, we lose water. And then we have this connection of that acetyl group to the morphine molecule. And then diacetylmorphine is heroin. So you see the diacetyl part. You've got one here and you've got one here. And then if we took this OH here and reacted it with acetic acid, again, it's these, these OHs that, that react with each other, 
we lose water and we have acetyl codeine. So we have acetyl here, the codeine has a methoxy group on in the three position. Okay. Now, if we take this, this um, hydroxy group and, and we oxidize it, we have oxidized codone, codeine or oxycodone. So this O-N-E is easy to remember because that's like a ketone and you see this, this carbonyl group. Does all make sense? Yeah, it's not too bad. Molecules look really complicated, but we're really just focusing on the chemistry of those two active sites, the three site and the six site. And so here are the three, yeah, they're shown right here. Here's the three position and the six position. So here's how, uh, with heroin synthesis, we reflux the morphine with acetic anhydride. So we've already taken the waters off of two of the acetic acids and reacted them with each other. And so this is a reactive molecule that can then interact with these hydroxy groups. And, and it reacts at the three place first. The three position is most reactive. Now, how do I find the three position if I'm just given a morphine molecule and it's not located exact or rotated exactly the way it is in, in, this, uh, in this particular slide? Look where the nitrogen is. So see the nitrogen is, is attached, this bridge, the way I've got the molecule drawn, this bridge is on the side of the six position. So that's how you can tell which, is, which side is the three side or which side is the six <coughs> side. So you look to see which side that nitrogen bridge is attached to. It's attached on the six side. So that make for some reason, the three side is more reactive. And so the acetylation happens at the three place first. If you let it go a little longer, then it'll attach to both places. And that's when you have the diacetylmorphine or heroin. If you cook it too long, then the three position deacetylates and you have six man. And so this is, this is old or overcooked <coughs> heroin. So there's a chemical marker for the age of the heroin or for a different manufacturer. So you can look at this ratio of, of uh, three mam to six mam and heroin. Those are gonna come out different places and you can you can uh, make some judgments related to sources and so on. Now, this is a chemical synthesis and it's typically performed in other countries and shipped via mules. Have you heard of mules across the border? These are people, and I mean, this is a, they've, they've put the heroin into little like balloons, okay, tied them up and had the person swallow them. And so here's an X-ray of a mule and you can see these capsules in their stomach and you can see some in their colon. So this one is in the ascending colon. This one is in the descending colon. And so they're, those are capsules of heroin. And then they get to the place where they're going. I guess they collect their money, take a bunch of laxatives and poop it all out. And then they take the, the capsules of drugs, break them out of the, hopefully they wash them, break them out of the, the plastic balloons and then, then sell the drugs. Okay. So. Yeah, and it's pretty scary to me to think about because that's way more than a, a deadly dose. So if one of those balloons were to break in their stomach, they're dead. Yeah. So um, here's some other kinds of separations that that can be done. Again, liquid liquid extraction. This is just showing that you can have the the base, whether that be the methamphetamine base, the heroin base, the uh, morphine base, or uh, cocaine base. In aqueous solution, okay, you can you can make that solution basic and drive that base into the organic phase and all the other stuff you can throw away, and then you can take that organic base to confirmatory testing. You could salt it out, make crystals, and so on. Uh, here's the tropane alkaloids and cocaine. So the coca, coca plant has this molecule in it naturally. Um, you've got different isomers there. And, and again, we're playing with the different isomers, whether we have like an equatorial position of this uh, acetyl group or an axial position. Um, here's this uh, uh, benzoic acid piece. It can be in uh, an axial position or as drawn here on this molecule, 
an equatorial position. There's four chiral centers on these cocaine derivatives. And so you've got a lot of different variety and, and maybe that'll give you some information. Here's a way to extract it from those leaves. You can chop the leaves and dry them. You've got a, an, an, an acid first, you've got an organic first or an aqueous first. And so let's do the aqueous first here. So we add uh, acid and protonate that cocaine and it goes into the aqueous phase. Okay, then you can, you can throw away all the stuff that doesn't dissolve. Then you can e extract the, the organic materials that have dissolved and uh, that, that are not protonated by that base. And then you can discard that organic layer. So the cocaine and its associated molecules that are like cocaine uh, are in the aqueous phase. You change the pH and deprotonate it, and now it moves in, uh, it, it'll crash out. So we've still got an aqueous solution. You change the pH and it just crashes out of the aqueous um, solution as an organic crystal. So that's the cocaine base. So this is really just like a one step, one organic layer. If you dissolve it first in an organic layer, then you can discard the aqueous layer. Then you add acid, another aqueous layer, and it will go into that aqueous solution. And so then you can throw away the organic layer that has all of the stuff that you don't want. Then you again add the base and it'll, it'll crash out of aqueous solution. And then this says, again, this is clandestine activity, right? What are you going to use for organic solvent? Sometimes they use gasoline or kerosene, which is not a pure solvent at all. So they'll, they'll dissolve it up into an organic solvent and then precipitate it out with an HCl generator. So all of these different roots will have different and unique contaminants. So that might be a fingerprint for how it was created. Uh, let's see, these are just sort of a, a laundry list of other kinds of drugs, right? Ergot, tryptamine, and hallucinogens. These are, these are not homemade. They're much more complicated to synthesize. Uh, now, some of the extracts might be done at home. The, you've got ergot from fungus, mescaline from peyote, and psilocin and psilocybin from, from different mushrooms. And then this is Lophophora williamsi, and that's no relation. So I don't, I don't know who that was. Uh, we have uh, some that don't necessarily generate hallucinogen, hallucinations, but cause this, this feeling of being out of your body. Um, the discoverer of LSD famously tried it a whole bunch, and he called it his problem child. And he had what he called demonic transformations. So not something I'm interested in. Non-alkaloids. Uh, so these would be just the... the um, Again, some, some of them are from the amphetamine family and, and fairly easy to make. Uh, it's an increasing problem. So there's some uh, lab cleanups that have been related to phenylethylamines. MDMA and uh, psilocybin and ketamine. Again, some of these are stolen from other uses like vet hospitals. And then here's the diverted pharmaceuticals. So these are, uh, a lot of times kids will steal their parents prescription for uh, pain medicines and sometimes the parents again for for whatever reason maybe they had a chronic back pain or they had surgery or something like that they get hooked on the um, the opioids and then they have a hard time finding prescriptions for it or they can't fill enough prescriptions and they go through the pills too fast and so then they start buying them on the clandestine market okay and the problem with that is is Sometimes those are laced with fentanyl. And so we've seen a lot of kids who die on their first use. They have no tolerance at all. And they'll take the pills, mom's pain pills. And we've seen a lot of folks, um, that's, that's been in the news fairly recently, of some pretty young kids try the parents' pain kills for the pills for the first time and die overdose on their first, on their first try. So um, we've got to do something about that. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm not a policymaker, but yeah, it's a pretty sad situation we've got. Here's a black black market pill manufacturing operation. I just wanted to show you how this could be in an apartment building. This is an apartment building in, in the Bronx, and they found not just the pills, but pill making equipment, presses with the imprints for the pharmaceutical uh, things. Here's all of the pills that they have. 
you know, they're not making these rainbow pills just for fun. These are the actual, if you go back to the desk reference, all the different colors of these different uh, pills. So they're mimicking legitimate pharmaceuticals and making counterfeit pharmaceuticals. So this is just showing you how many, uh, how many things they had. They were trying to sell 3,000 oxycodone pills in, the, in a, exchange for $20,000. Um, they had, a, they had them, uh, they went back to their apartment and, and like arrested them and, and found all this equipment. They had a, a pill press machine, a pill press imprint to, to create oxycodone marking. And then they had all kinds of, you know, vacuum sealers and so on. And they had a fridge uh, filled with food containers holding all the different precursors. So they had precursors, they had all of the paraphernalia like grinders and containers and cutting agents and so on. And so, the, you know, because of the danger of fentanyl, the, you know, the cleanup people dressed up in full, you know, hazmat suits. And then this was uh, one of the most amazing books to read. It was very hard to read. It's very uh, troubling to read. But just Kermit Gosnell in, in Philadelphia in his clinic, they, the DEA group busted his smil, pill smurfing scheme. So he was writing out fake prescriptions to people and selling the fake prescriptions. So he wasn't selling the pills, but he was selling the prescriptions for the pills. And then they would go near, near to a nearby pharmacy who also got uh, shut down because they were filling obviously fake prescriptions. When the same person comes in night after night and buys 30 different, you know, tablets and so on. So, you know, here, down here at the bottom, this, uh, again, these are all fake names. He let Fiona use 26 different patient names and he would sell her 200 scripts a night. And, and that was $20 per prescription. So that's 4,000 a night. Just writing little pieces of paper. Yeah. So that's what, uh, that's what got him in trouble. The DEA went to shut his women's clinic down in Philadelphia. And then they, as they were walking through, they realized that he was also running just this unbelievably uh, disgusting and, and terrible, dirty abortion clinic. And so he was also abusing women there, too, in, in quote, providing them abortions. But there was, I mean, there were cats running around. He had a 14-year-old running anesthesia. I mean, it was crazy. So if you want to, like a I mean, like a true crime drama read or whatever. I, I recommend this book if you can if you can handle it. Uh, what was interesting, the people, uh, Anne McElhinney and Philip McAleer, uh, they they did all the research for this book. They shut down this guy's clinic, and then they had, uh, um, you know, his court case, and they were in in Philadelphia for a completely different reason. And they heard that this court case was going on. And so they went in and the, the, there was no press there, nothing. And they're documentarians. And so they were like, why is this story being ignored? And so they started pulling the thread on the story, talking to the people involved. And so that's what they, they wrote this book. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. Because they're not necessarily like, you know, sometimes he is a very, uh, yeah, that's very strange. I don't know. Yeah. I'll have to go back and read the forwards. Sorry, no, that's a, that's great. Yeah. That, that it, I don't know. That's really interesting. So I'll have to go back and see if there was some connection he had to the story or, or what. Yeah. I don't know. It could be, but you know, I mean, these things don't write themselves and the documentaries, there's a movie too. The documentaries don't make themselves, but yeah, you got me curious now. All right. So I'll, I'll end it there. And, uh, I, I hate to, you know, not give you a full hour and, and, and 15 minutes, but.